The Voronoi and Voronoi Edges algorithms can be used to create some really stunning art in GLSL, like 3D terrain, abstract bump mapped patterns, and stained glass effects. In this two-part tutorial series, you will get full visual and vector-based walkthroughs of how the Voronoi and Voronoi Edges algorithms work, as well as some techniques you can use to go further and make beautiful artwork of your own. The Voronoi pattern in general depends on having positions of points and a way to get the closest points distance for each pixel. So a basic example might look like this. You have your positions, you have distances to those positions for each pixel, uh, we take their union giving us the closest distance, and we shade each pixel based on the distance to the closest point to it. But we want a procedural pattern so we can have lots of points, potentially an infinite number of points as we move through some sort of terrain and it needs to run in real time like 60 frames per second. So the solution to this problem is a hash function. A hash function uh, can take an input value and give you a random output value. It's creating an association between that input and the random output. So for any given input, you always get the same output. Here's an example of what we would want. A 2D hash function, we give it a 1, 0, and we always get out 0 0.6, 0 0.2. So this is the code for such a function by Dave Hoskins on ShaderToy, and I put that code on everything. Uh, our basic strategy is to divide the screen into numbered grid cells, use those numbers as inputs for the hash function, and use the output to make put point positions. Here's what our grid cells might look like if we had a 5x3 grid. Each of these is mapped to a random offset using the hash function, and here are the resulting offsets from the hash function. So here, as a visual example, we have a gradients representing the distances to points. Uh, as to how these circles are positioned for now, just imagine each cell, it has its origin, uh, original cell value, and we add that offset that gives us the location of each point in each cell. We draw different point distance gradients in each cell, uh, which is why there's this cutting off between cells. Uh, what we want, though, is this. Neighboring cells fill in the missing information about which point is closest for a given pixel. So here's a visual demonstration of how that would work uh, for this cell outlined in red. The cell will check each of its neighbors and draw what it can of that neighbor's point gradient. So we check the bottom left and clearly the point in that cell is too far for us to have anything to draw so we continue on. We check the middle left and we draw almost half of that point's gradient. We continue this way to the top left and draw some of its gradient and we don't end up drawing too much of it because we're taking the union and the earlier point was closer for many of the pixels in the cell. We keep going, drawing a bit there. Here we draw the point in our own cell. As you can see, even that point isn't always the closest point for every pixel in the cell. And we continue and on and continue on. And that is the last of our nine immediate neighbors. So there's generally no need to extend beyond that uh, as points further away would be too far to draw anyhow. If each pixel in each cell carried out the full procedure, we would end up with this. And if we color the pixels, only based on the closest point without any gradient, we would get this, the classic Verona pattern. So the question remains, how do we actually use these offsets to build the correct positions for neighboring cells? Uh, here is the main image uh, where I'm calling the basic Verona uh, function with this UV scale by 8. And there is a code for the basic Verona algorithm in all its glory. Uh, we start by dividing the screen into grid cells. Actually, this would be an 8x8 grid, but for the sake of consistency, I'm using the same grid I showed earlier. Um, we set a minimum distance that's guaranteed to be higher than any resulting distance after going through our process. That allows us to use a starting value in the process without any consequences. Now, we enter the double for loop, which we'll use to build our neighbor direction vector. We use that to find the offsets for all nine cells, including our own, which will hit when the vector is 0, 0. And this is where we use our hash function to generate an offset. The input is built from the current cell plus whatever neighbor we are helping to draw for, for visual demonstration with vectors. We start with our floor UV, which is our current cell value. We add a neighbor direction, in this case, one zero. So we're finding the offset for the right middle cell out of the nine possible cells. And it goes to the hash function and out comes an offset. 
this hash offset is really a vector from origin, as all vectors can be seen as, uh, but I draw these three vectors tip to tail because we do plan to add them together. And here we do that addition. So the white vector is the sum of the three vectors, uh, points to the offset, and the correct and is correct as a global position. So by that I mean it's the true position of that point on the screen. So hopefully that already clarifies how these offsets contribute to the location of points in a coherent way. Um, these points can now be seen as positioned globally, but here of course they're only drawn uh, by pixels in their cell. Uh, so just to take it a step further, if we have a second pixel with a second UV, UV2, and it pointed to its left, negative one zero, the resulting neighbor would be the same, uh, the same, uh, the, the offset would be the same, and the resulting position, uh, the sum of the green vectors this time, and that blue offset one would end up in the same place. So it would also be helping to draw what it can of that same, uh, of that same neighbor. And after that, the actual drawing is based on distance, which we calculate by taking the length of the vector created by subtracting our neighbor's global position from our global UV. So this is true. This is the true UV from zero to eight on uh, the X and Y uh, we said, uh, and the true offset also is somewhere in that range. And then we compare that with a minimum distance and if we have a closer point, we would want to draw that one instead. So that's the distance we would store. And that's how we come out with this, which we can color and animate and all of those good things. Uh, so if you've read or watched any other tutorials on this algorithm, you've probably uh, seen a version using the fract function. And fract is nice because when you think of making a grid of circles or, or a grid of anything in GLSL, it's usually what comes to mind immediately. Uh, this is closer to the canonical Voronoi algorithm here. Uh, the way most tutorials on Voronoi algorithms go is you use the fract UV, which sets up a grid of coordinate systems. I'll call them local systems since they are all from 0 to 1, and they've basically lost all their information about where they really are on the screen. So you create your neighbor distance vectors as usual, and in order to create the offset, you still need that current cell value, uh, which is global, in that it's telling us where the cell actually is on the screen. That's the only way these algorithms can work. Uh, so then we don't create a global position. Uh, in, uh, instead, we just point to the neighbor direction and add that offset. So how can this work? Well, when we check the distance, we just use that global or that local coordinate as well. So basically what we're saying is relative to our local coordinate, where is this other point? It's the answer is it's insert neighbor away plus that neighbor's offset. So it's the same distance uh, because all the neighboring points are exactly one neighbor vector away plus their offset. And we used the global current cell value to get that offset. Right. So part of why I didn't use fract here and I, I don't plan to use it in the second part of this video or tutorial is to challenge the way of thinking about this algorithm. I don't think that it's wrong to think about it this way at all. I just think that it's bad if it's the only way that people know how to think about it. Uh, for example, in my case, for a, a while, um, each time I would stop writing shaders for a month or so and come back, uh, this algorithm would always be a sticking point. I'd have to go and look up exactly how people are writing it. And that's because I never got a deep enough understanding um, of how it really worked um, to have a solid picture. So when I finally did the deep work, I came out with this, which is why I thought I should share. So hopefully this video will encourage you to revisit other implementations of this and try to see exactly what the code is doing. And you might be surprised uh, what, what the code is really saying in some cases. Uh, although I could also be missing something or making a big deal out of nothing. So let me know. Um, and there's other things I've seen written in different ways um, on Shader Toy and elsewhere regarding the Veronoi edges. So I'll mention those when we get there. Uh, in the second part of this tutorial, we'll look at how to find the distance to the closest cell edges uh, for each pixel on the screen. That will give us distances that we can use to color in all sorts of ways. And I'll show you um, how you can produce stunning images using the Verona edges algorithm along with some lighting calculations that have been modified to work uh, in uh, two-dimensional patterns. So I hope uh, to have that video out by the end of this week. Until then, thanks for watching.